I was invited to give a linguistics talk, and so I will be talking specifically about linguistic data. Um, linguistic data coming from one language, Ihanzu. Even for those of us not directly involved in documentary linguistics, I hope this talk will be interesting and useful in that it presents and contextualizes linguistic data and asks us to think about its provenance, its shortcomings, and the challenges inherent in its use. This archive collection is the result of a large multimedia documentation of Ihanzu language and cultural material, and this talk provides an overview of the contents of this collection, gives examples of how the collection can be searched and interpreted, and suggests some threads running through the collection that might be fruitful for future exploration. In describing the collection, it is hoped that researchers from other disciplines, both linguistic and beyond, can better suggest ways in which the materials therein might be used, better understood, and enriched. As a note, this talk will be made openly accessible online, both archived with Zenodo with the DOI on screen, as well as watchable directly on YouTube via the channel link QR code on screen. I make use of a handful of QR codes throughout this talk, so if you're interested, do scan and uh, look further into them. For a bit further context, my work in language documentation began in 2012 during my master's studies at the University of Dar es Salaam, where I began making recordings of the Gorwa language as part of my dissertation. This continued on and off through my doctoral studies at SOAS, during which I continued working with Gorwa, essentially making recordings on my own and deciding the who, what, when, where, and why of the language documentation myself. Things changed around 2017 when myself and my Gorwa colleagues decided to try something new. Instead of me going around with the camera and the recording device, we decided that actually training Gorwa speakers themselves to conduct this work would not only be more efficient, but would also result in a richer documentation. So from this point essentially to present, the Gorwa language documentation project continues with Gorwa speakers themselves not only producing the recordings, but deciding who to interview, what to talk about, and how to go about exploring their histories, languages, and cultures. This insider-led approach was really a turning point in my documentary praxis, and basically all documentations I've been part of have been insider-led projects. In 2019, my colleague Richard Griscom and I began an ELDP-funded project to document the Hadza language, spoken nearby to where Gorwa is spoken in central Tanzania. And in the same year, I began a similar insider-led project to document Ihanzu, spoken in the same region of Tanzania, which we often call the Tanzanian Rift Valley. This talk will focus on the documentary outcomes thus far of the Ihanzu project. For a bit more context, Ihanzu, as mentioned above, is spoken in Tanzania, primarily an area of north-central Tanzania that myself and others often refer to as the Tanzanian Rift Valley. From an administrative perspective, it is spoken in and around Mkalama district, which itself is in the larger Singida region. Geographically, the area is largely flat, with one large hill towards the center. Each of the blue circles here indicates a major Ihanzu settlement. For more information, as well as images and video, I'd encourage you to listen to a talk I gave in 2021, which can be accessed via the QR code that I'll leave on screen for the next few slides. Genetically speaking, Ihanzu is a Bantu language, specifically of a group of languages known as the Takama branch of Bantu. This includes very large languages such as Sukuma and Nyamwezi, together spoken by around 10 million people, as well as very small languages such as Kimbu, spoken by closer to 50,000 people. One can see from the table that there exists some fairly strong lexical correspondences between these languages, but this can again be looked at in more detail in the 2021 talk. This is a map of the Tanzanian Rift Valley from a classic work by Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse in 2008 which gives us a rough idea of the languages spoken in the area. Famously, the Rift Valley is the only place on the African continent in which all four of Greenberg's 1960s African language phyla are in contact, 
and have been in contact for a long time. As such, Ihanzu can be shown to exist in a rich and diverse regional language ecology, with both Takama branch Bantu languages, to which we will remember Ihanzu is closely genetically related, as well as non-Takama branch Bantu languages, which, uh, to which Ihanzu is more distantly related. Ihanzu is also in contact with Nilotic languages, the most famous of which is the Eastern Nilotic language Maasai, but contact is more robust with the southern Nilotic Totoga varieties. Ihanzu is also in contact with Cushitic languages, especially Iraq. The language Sandawe, possibly a distant member of the Khoi Kwadi family, is also spoken in the area. And finally, Ihanzu is in close geographical contact with the language isolate Hadza. In terms of language use and attitudes, I would first say that this topic deserves considerably more attention before I can say anything of great insight, but suffice it to say that Ihanzu has around 26,000 speakers, and its usage is certainly declining as its speakers switch to using the national ling lingua franca Swahili. In my experience, Ihanzu speakers do not see their language in a negative light, but the idea of maintaining their language is often submerged in homogenizing discourses of progress and modernization, almost as if the loss of the language is a prerequisite, or at least an unavoidable consequence of development. The Ihanzu collection itself is housed within the Endangered Languages Archive, commonly known by its acronym ELAR, or ELAR. Along with deposits large and small from over 400 other languages, each of which can be seen as a point on this map. Importantly, ELAR is a digital archive, that is, it doesn't host physical documents and artifacts, as a more traditional archive like the one in the image to the left. Instead, all of ELAR's holdings are electronic, so the contents are made up of sound, video, image, and various text files such as the image to the right. All in all, the Hanzu collection currently contains sound and media files from approximately 282 hours of recording. Because quantity is a dimension of the comprehensiveness of a language documentation, a natural question to ask is, well, is this a large documentation? The answer is not actually that easy to find. It turns out that there often isn't an easy way to access how many hours of recordings are contained in an archive deposit, and so we can only rely on the handful of recent detailed deposit outlines made by other documentary linguists. When we take these reports into account, it does turn out that yes, the Ihanzu documentation is relatively large. In fact, the only larger deposit I currently know of is the other community-led documentation with which I am involved, that of Gorwa. Now, the follow-on question is, is this documentation big enough? That's even less straightforward to answer. We need to recognize that quantity is only one dimension of what makes a language documentation comprehensive, and depending on the goals of the documentation, this may be sufficient or it may not be. The point is that this kind of measure is only one among a range of others, only some of which will be explored in this talk. With that said, let us return to looking at the Ihanzu deposit on its own, and break down what these 282 hours of recordings actually are. So, of these 282 hours of recordings, about three hours are of consent, about 56 hours are of elicitation, about seven hours are of prompted speech, and the rest, about 216 hours, are of natural speech. And broken down into a chart showing minutes of recording per month, the distribution looks like this. We will return to these graphics and variations of them throughout the remainder of the talk. But first, I would like to explain and exemplify what exactly each of these four categories is. We'll start with consent, which is the most uniform of each of these categories, 
and refers to the recordings documenting the process by which each speaker registers their informed accord to be included in the documentation. This is a series of recordings either of myself or one of the local Ihanzu researchers going through a verbal template, typically in Swahili, in which we ask participants for their permission to be recorded, make it clear how much they will be paid for their work, as well as generally talk about concepts such as archives and open access. The script is largely adapted from the one provided in Claire Bowern's 2008 work on linguistic fieldwork. And I think that this is a good, pretty comprehensive model. We decided that all consent would be collected orally rather than in a written form to avoid mistrust around signing unfamiliar looking contracts, as well as to help people who may not be able to read or write. Next, I'd like to talk about elicitation. Of all the linguistic data recorded, the elicitation is the most formalized, that is, the speaker is the most constrained in terms of how they answer. Elicitation includes several different types, three of the major ones listed here. Most common by far is translation, where I would provide a word or phrase in Swahili and the consultant would give an equivalent in Ihanzu. This recording, for example, is of me asking for the Ihanzu word for a gap in the teeth. Pengo. Meongia kuhusu pengo sasa. Sehemu ambapo jino ilikuwepo, lakini sasa yupo. Inaitua nkende. Kamli zaidi ya moja? Nkende. The transcription of this recording is also available in the archive. Another type of elicitation is data manipulation, where I would take an Ihanzu word and modify it into a novel form, often to see if it was grammatical or not. In this example, I'm testing verbal reduplication in Ihanzu by taking the word for hit, kokoa, and reduplicating it to form kokoakua to see if my consultant Musa could get any sense from it. In this case, it turns out he could. Mvulana anampiga fisi. Mohombo me kwa mhiti. Mohombo me kwa mhiti. Sasa nikijaribu muhumba ukume kwa kwa mhiti. Muhumba ukume kwa kwa mhiti. Kijana anapiga piga fisi. Kwa wewe unaweza kusema? Mohombo me kwa kwa mhiti. Mohombo me kwa kwa mhiti. Na mana ake ni nani ni kijana anampiga piga. Ena ipiga piga. The result was different, however, for the verb kumwa, to drink, with which I tried the same manipulation. Mohomba ukumwa makai. Ni kijaribu muhumba ukumwa ngwa magai. Muhumba ukumwa ngwa magai. Mohomba okungwa ngwa ngwa magai. Mohomba okungwa ngwa ngwa magai. Wakini ni kisema muhumba muhumba okungwa ngwa magai. Okungwa ngwa magai. Paka unasema muhumba okungwa ngwa ngwa. It turns out that for the verb kungwa, reduplication is ungrammatical and re-triplication is used. This is evident in how Musa corrects me and then even goes so far to say in Swahili that it's not correct until I say the re-triplicated form kungwangwangwa. Both forms for hit and drink are recorded with interlinearization along with their recordings. Back translation also occurs throughout the elicitation and involves me giving the consultant an Ihanzu word or phrase and asking for a Swahili translation. Moving to prompted speech, it forms the smallest data type collection. This is mainly because I found it useful at the beginning of the project, but quickly found natural speech more valuable as time went on. All of the prompted speech in this collection involves the use of stimulus tools setting up a situation or game which a speaker or speakers would play in order to re record speech that in some way will yield a specific sort of data. In this example, Isaac and Musa were given a set of bird photos, but put in a different order. Isaac, sitting in the left of the frame here, is describing to Musa here at the right the image he has, while Musa tries to find the matching photo in his collection. 
So here we got lots of different kinds of data. We recorded a lot of questions as well as descriptive language, including adjectives. Finally, the largest and the most heterogeneous type of recorded data in the collection is represented by natural speech. This includes recordings of basically any sort which have not been contrived by the researcher and during which the speaker or speakers are the least constrained. They may be based around a single question like, let's talk about Ihanzu vegetables, or perhaps a topic like, today I'm going to tell you a story about two young men. The two primary subtypes represented in natural speech are conversational texts and ritual texts. A conversational text is, as its name, an event in which at least two speakers are involved. This was the most common sort of recording made by the Ihanzu local researchers. Here, Ihanzu local researcher Samuele Isia is sitting with John Kipimo, talking about Ihanzu literary genres, including stories. Kendele kwa adaka adaki humira pero kutakile kila aliki ekali ema humo no vila aliki aimenda falungui sasa nakile kwa lelo kila aliki neke uvila aliki aida okite uzaki ee ya antawaiti uvila aliki Nima humo. Ya ntaiti aedha kore ndugu eye. Ingwi. Ingwi. Enso kao, aedha takile iti. Ya ntawaiti, alinga paite panaidha, ni panaidhi. Ange nyaitu kwa. Anaitu. Another subtype of natural speech is what I call ritual text. These sorts of recordings... have the speaker somewhat restrained, but not by the researcher, but by the fact that the text itself is largely set. Something like a prayer or a song, for example. Here is a rather raucous song in which Howard Mangali calls and John Minazi responds. <laughs> And for this particular song, we have its transcription with interlinearization and glosses. Other types of materials uh, include images, specifically of the consultants, as well as photos of my rough field notes. Returning now to the chart showing minutes of recording by month, a story of the documentation emerges. The first two months of data collection can be seen to have actually occurred way back in 2016. This represents a short, approximately two-week period when I visited Singida town, here the area in the lower circle on the map, itself capital of the larger Singida region. My goal here was to meet speakers of Ihanzu, to get a handful of basic vocabulary and syntax, and more importantly, to better understand where in Singida region speakers of the language actually lived. The upper circle on the map represents where I actually ended up living 
while doing later Ihanzu research. I was lucky to find both Mr. Samueli Msemakweli, as well as Reverend Onesmo Dadi, pictured here with his wife, who were very hospitable and entertained my first questions about their language, uh, as well as where would be a good place to meet more speakers. This second chunk of data collection, which took place over four months in 2018, was rather more serious and represents days of several weeks in Ibago working primarily on word lists, as well as a series of questions developed by uh, Guerrois, Gibson, and Martin in 2018 for their list of Bantu morphosyntactic parameters. This is also where I did some of those short sections of prompted speech, uh, all primarily from the comfort of the Sayuni guest house. These two contributions made in August 2018 and August 2019 are actually not mine at all, but represent fieldwork conducted by Dr. Stanislav Boletsky, a lecturer at the University of Dodoma in Tanzania, who also works with Ihanzu. Dr. Boletsky was kind enough to contribute his materials to be archived with the Ihanzu collection, which features some elicitation with, with Ihanzu speaker Erasto John Linza, as well as some incredible stories and songs from Salim Shabani, a truly consummate vocalist and storyteller. For those of you interested in listening to a talk given by Stanislav about the role of songs in Ihanzu narratives, you can follow the link in the QR code on screen. In January 2020, we can see a marked change in the texture of the data being recorded, both in terms of volume as well as in terms of type. Not only does the average number of minutes recorded basically double, but most of it is now natural speech. This marks the real beginning of the community-led documentation project I had mentioned in the introduction. Here, the two local researchers, Sara Kalayel in the photo above and Samueli Isia in the photo below, both working with Mr. John Kipimo here, traveled in and around the Ihanzu speaking area, working with Ihanzu speakers and recording songs, stories, and discussions ranging from things like accounts of historic migrations and the settling of the current Ihanzu homeland to things like rainmaking rituals and how to raise children. For those of you who might be interested in what the initial training for a project like this looked like, you can find an account written by my colleague Richard Griscom and myself by following the QR code on screen. As for the bursts of green elicitation, these represent my work primarily conducting more collection of vocabulary, learning about the morphosyntax of the language, as well as lexical and grammatical tone. Finally, the two chunks of elicitation during the final two months of data collection represented data collected during a field methods course held here at Bielefeld University, in which participants conducted elicitation with them on one side in Germany and myself and Nihonzu speaker, in this case Samueli Isia, on the other side in Tanzania. This was a really fun process and resulted in some great insights and learning on both sides, and I'm very excited to repeat it again in September. Of the 34 speakers represented in the archive collection, 26 are male and 8 are female. Even though we made it a point of having one male and one female local researcher, I think that this imbalance is down to larger gender and power dynamics which exist both within the Ihanzu community as well as Tanzanian society in general. With that said, not all speakers contributed an equal amount of recordings to the collection, and the contribution of men and women in terms of minutes in the collection is a bit less skewed. The oldest speaker represented in the collection was born in 1923, and the youngest in 1987. Of the 34 participants, none was monolingual. In fact, I have yet to meet a speaker of Ihanzu who does not also speak Swahili. In addition to those speakers who could speak both Ihanzu and Swahili, at least 10 participants could also speak a third language. In many cases, this was a nearby Bantu language, such as Nyilamba or Sukuma, but in several cases, this was English, the language of higher education. I'd like now to provide a bit of information on how to use the collection. 
The first and perhaps the most important thing to note is that I have been calling it the Ihanzu Collection and not the Ihanzu Corpus. This is mainly because what we have created thus far is not solely a collection of transcribed and translated texts that are ready to search by linguists. Indeed, there are elements in the collection which resemble corpora and which could probably be used as such, but in the end, what is represented in this work is rather more than that. Associated with this, an important factor in using the collection is knowing what stage of processing an individual recording is at. For this project, I've distinguished three basic levels, which here I'll simply call step one, step two, and step three. Basically, any recording must pass through each of these steps in sequence. Materials in step one have been assigned a unique file name and have been given the proper metadata. That is, the file now has a name which cannot be mixed up with other files, and we have a rough description of what the recording contains. All of the material in the Ihanzu collection have reached this level of processing at least. So, for example, the files associated with the recording in the image above not only have a unique identifier, but the recording session is also described in terms of what the topic of conversation was, where it took place, who it involved, etc. Recordings which have entered step two have been listened to, segmented in Elon, transcribed, and given a Swahili transcription. Because this step is carried out by the Ihanzu local researchers, the Ihanzu transcriptions are not standardized. That is, the way a word is written may not be consistent or correspond to how I would write it in a more standardized working orthography. With that said, recordings which have reached step two can be read for their content by anyone literate in Swahili and would therefore be useful to people interested in their narrative content. So here in this recording, we see time-aligned transcriptions of the Ihanzu with the Swahili translations of that directly below. Step three represents what I see basically as a final step in uh, the basic process processing of the data and involves looking through the rough Ihanzu transcriptions and adjusting them to the working orthography, providing an English translation, as well as parsing and glossing each utterance into constituent morphemes. Obviously, this is a highly time-consuming step, and at present, one that can only be done by me. Here we can see an Elon file in the image above, featuring an adjusted transcription of the Ihanzu in a working orthography. And uh, below that, the same utterance numbered and parsed and glossed according to my best understandings of the language at the time. This would probably be the material of most use to a linguist. Now, looking at processing rates, how much of this material has actually passed through steps two and three? We can actually get an idea of the kinds of things this collection can currently be used for. Starting with elicitation, once again represented in green, we can see that almost half has been fully processed. This is mainly thanks to the time afforded me by a postdoc in 2019 and 2020 at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies during which I could focus on the earliest recordings of elicitation and really see them through. In terms of prompted speech, the progress is naturally slower because the material is rather more dense and complex. So here we can see that nothing has made it to the final step, though around a third of the material has been given a rough Ihanzu transcription and a Swahili translation. Natural speech represents the greatest challenge, but in many ways also the most rewarding. Currently, of the 216 hours of natural speech recordings, around 19 hours have been transcribed and translated. A single recording of around 12 minutes has been given a standardized Ihanzu transcription and an English translation, as well as full parsing and glossing. Returning then to a global view of the collection, we can see that only a small fraction has been processed to a level where the average linguist would find it useful. This is due to a phenomenon in the language documentation literature as the transcription bottleneck. This refers to the reality that, while it is now technically possible to record and archive a large volume of language material, the rendering of these materials into transcripts, in this case with a standardized orthography, an English translation, as well as a time-aligned pars parsing and glossing, is the most time-consuming task, and in practice will take exponentially more time than it took to collect the materials. 
Himmelmann, 2006, goes so far as to warn of so-called data graveyards, which he defines as large heaps of data with little or no use to anyone. Indeed, if this were the end of the story and this chart represented a, sta a static situation, the largest portion of these recorded materials would be in danger of falling into this category. Happily, however, the Ihanzu project is not static, and in addition to Sara and Samueli's continued work in transcribing and translating the natural speech texts, I continue to chip away at the parsing and glossing of the texts. Perhaps most exciting, however, is the possibility of linguists other than the myself finding these materials interesting and useful, and themselves contributing to the archived collection, either by raising awareness of the language and of the collection through their own work, or even developing tools to address the transcription bottleneck. As part of this, I will now take some time to explore how to use the collection. Once again, the Endangered Languages Archive, E-L-A-R, or ELAR for short, is a digital web-based archive, and many of these collections are accessible with a login. It was decided early on in the Ihanzu project to have the recorded materials as easily accessible and reusable as possible, so the Ihanzu materials can be accessed without any sort of login or registration with the archive, and usable under what is essentially a Creative Commons attribution share alike license. The first step to accessing the materials is to navigate to the deposit page. This can be done via its handle, which is given in full form as well as in a QR code on the screen. I'll leave this QR code on screen for the next few slides. Here we can see that the deposit page is made of several distinct parts. The uppermost part has to do with the site navigation as well as searching across all collections. This midsection, highlighted here, provides information about the Ihanzu collection as a whole. This section to the lower right, highlighted here, provides some of the recording sessions, which I'll refer to as bundles. Clicking on any of these bundles will take you to a more specific information about the recording session, as well as allow access to all of its constituent media. The section to the lower left, highlighted here, essentially provides a series of filters customized to the individual deposit, which can be used to narrow the search. So, say for example, we encounter this recording or data from it, and want to go back and look at it in more detail. There are several ways we might do this. The first is by its title. It's called Bird Images 13. If we had this piece of information, we could navigate to the Ihanzu deposit page and simply write it in the highlighted search box, labeled Search Within. If we do this and then click Search, we will get a page like this, with the top result corresponding to a bundle containing all the information about the media files uh, and the media files themselves associated with this recording. Another way, and perhaps a more common way to encounter the recording, is by its unique identifier. Here, we can even see this on screen as it is part of the file name of the ALON file. In this case, that unique identifier is 2018-0704A. Once again, on the deposit page, we can enter this unique identifier into the Search Within box, highlighted here, and click Search. In this case, this yields exactly the same results. Another way to find the same piece of information is to use the Refine Your Selection box, highlighted here in the lower left of the screen. These filters occur in groups, so here we can see recordings sorted by genres. Given that we know that our recording of interest employed stimulus tools, we could click the filter called Stimulus Tools. This would once again resolve to a list of results, of which our recording of interest is a part. There are many filters and combinations of filters we could try. A particularly rich option is to filter by keywords. These are more specific than genres and can refer to locations, things mentioned in the recording, grammatical constructions, etc. Because we know our recording is about birds, we could click the birds keyword filter. And once again, we receive a result like this, containing our desired search result as well as any other recording that deals with or mentions birds. 
Once we've done a search, and that search has hopefully turned up an array of results, we can click one of them to see what's inside. Each of the bundle titles here is clickable, so let's choose our favorite recording, highlighted here. This brings us to the individual bundle page. At the top is all the information about the recording session itself, and to the lower right is a list of media files associated with that recording. Looking at the bundle data, we can click the Show More toggle, which expands this view to show all of the information recorded for this bundle. For the Ihanzu collection, this includes things like the title, the unique identifier, who participated in the recording, as well as a description of the recording session. This is itself made up of an English description, a Swahili translation of that description, as well as specific information for how to go about citing this recording if it is used elsewhere. Returning now to the media files, each of the files is clickable. And note that they are all defined within the archive as open access. Again, this means that there is no sign up or login process required to access them. Here we have a .wav file and the associated video file. If we click on the .wav file, we can actually listen to it in the browser. And this is the same with the video file. And each media file can also be downloaded onto a user's machine by clicking the button highlighted in red here. Any .xml files are ALON files, so downloading this one would yield this file, which has been translated and transcribed, but not yet parsed and glossed. For researchers looking to access files that have been processed, perhaps the most useful method is by once again using the Refine Your Selection filters and finding the two keywords which begin with Deposit 596 workflow status. By filtering with the first one, all recordings which have reached step two will be returned. And by filtering with the second one, all recordings which have reached step three will be returned. Equipped with this knowledge, I'd now like to very briefly walk through the beginnings of what linguistic research with the collection might look like. Let's take applicatives as an example. Applicatives are a widespread feature in languages of the Bantu language family and refer to morphemes which, when affixed to a verb, increase the valency of the verb by one additional argument. So take, for example, a well-known Bantu language like Swahili. The phrase mvulana amelala means the boy lay down. Compare this to mvulana amelalia mkeka, the boy lay down on the mat. Here we have the verb to lay down modified to take an additional argument. In this case, the mat upon which the boy is laying down. This is accomplished by uh, a small suffix highlighted here. In the literature, this is commonly called the applicative suffix. So let's say that knowing Ihanzu is also a Bantu language, we want to see if it too uses applicative morphology, what it looks like, and what it does semantically to verbs. We would begin, as always, at the deposit page. And perhaps first of all, we could try basic search within the collection, entering the term applicative into the search within box. Doing this actually returns two very nice results, two elicitation sessions during which I specifically focus on applicatives. If we click on the first one, we will receive both the .wav recording as well as the ALON file. In this case, this recording has reached step three of processing, so it has been parsed and glossed, and the interlinearized text is also available. Here we can see the difference between the form ukikie is sitting and ukikaila is sitting on something, in this case a gourd. We can also see that I've proposed the applicative morpheme is something like the suffix of the form il. As with all of the transcriptions, this may be right or wrong, but it's certainly a starting place for anyone who would want to seriously look at this phenomenon. Having exhausted our two results, which come from basically searching the term applicative, we might then return to the deposit page and using the refine your selection filters, we might want to peruse other interlinearizations. Again, we can do this by selecting the filter which returns all recordings which have reached step three of processing. But we can actually go even further than that and download a flex database, which includes all of the parsed and glossed material in one place. We can do that once again by going to Refine Your Search and selecting Analysis. 
this filter will return a hodgepodge of photocopies, field notes, uh, but perhaps most valuable, a version of the Flex database. This can then be downloaded and used to say, for example, conduct a correspondence search for the applicative morphine throughout the entire corpus, and this time it really is a corpus of parsed and glossed texts. I unfortunately don't have the time today to talk in detail about the way that Flex software works, but suffice it to say that it is a powerful piece of software, and highlighted here is the result of a concordance search in Flex for the word hyena, in PT, in which we can see every instance of that form, as well as, on the right-hand side, the larger contexts in which the word occurs. For our applicative example, this would obviously be a very useful way to deepen our understanding. In terms of larger prospects, and I've said this before elsewhere, but the only limit to what can be done with these materials rests with the imagination of the researcher. Here we have a project from Nai San, a linguist at Stanford University, who is currently developing a tutorial on developing natural language processing workflows for language documentation projects. He is currently using some of the Hanzu material as the example materials for these tutorials, and who knows, maybe in the future we may see a machine-assisted way out of that transcription bottleneck. I'm personally most excited about the collection's prospects as it relates to the Ihanzu speaking community itself, and I take a lot of inspiration from projects that seek to connect speaker communities to the language materials that are, in all rights, theirs. Much work remains to be done here, and there are many conversations left to be had in Mkalama district about what this could look like, but I'm enthusiastic about the potential of such language work in the future. To conclude then, the Ihanzu collection, a large multimedia archive of cultural and linguistic material from the Ihanzu people, is in one sense a research outcome. It is the result of several years and hundreds of hours of labor, especially from local researchers and the people they worked with. It is large, represents a diverse array of materials, and I hope serves to honor the language and its speaker community. In many other ways, the Ihanzu collection is the beginnings of research, a large amount of materials which in many ways are raw, incomplete, and not fully accessible. As such, there remains a tremendous amount of work in further developing the collection, especially in realizing the full potential of its current contents. Today's presentation is obviously an attempt to make this a bit more transparent for other linguists who may be interested in working with language material from a language which has unfortunately featured very little in larger discourse of language and linguistics. Obviously, a whole other talk remains for the speakers of Ihanzu itself regarding how the collection can best serve their needs and their aspirations. I hope to, in some ways, engage in both dialogues and now look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. And here are my references.